So in other words, our, our system, our groove tube rating system is based on how tubes sound, not how much power they produce. Because in the end of it, that's what we're evaluating is how things sound. If I can't give you a set of tubes that make your amp sound better, then you don't need to be buying groove tubes, frankly. Fortunately, you do need to buy ground tubes because we figured out how to make them sound better. And here's how we did this. Again, we looked at the, the characteristics that we could measure that would be meaningful. So we're not going to measure power anymore over here. We're going to measure this distortion. So the way we did this, we, let's pick a number that we know we're going to hear. And we might call that number, let's call it 5% uh, uh, THD. We want to know when that tube's really into clipping. Uh, when that tube is really starting to add stuff to it. And of course, what that means is you've got 95% of your original signal the way it was supposed to sound, but we're adding something. Now the tube is being additive. I've tried playing without a tube amp, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Tubes add something to your sound, and this is what it adds. Is we're characterizing that. And we noticed a very interesting thing. If we said we want to measure how much power each of these tubes are putting out, uh, when it reaches this magic goal that might be the amount of distortion we're looking for, uh, and we notice something very interesting and very meaningful that some tubes, maybe at 10 watts or half their output, were hitting this goal. And other tubes, maybe not until 12, maybe not until 15, maybe not until 18 watts, were these tubes generating the same level of harmonically audible uh, contribution of the sound, if you will. Uh, and then we put those tubes together. In other words, we take a pair of tubes that started generating a certain fixed amount of characteristic at half power, others at maybe three-quarter power, others maybe not until right at the top. And that's pretty much what we found is that they're at the very low levels, when you're not playing very loud, the amp isn't contributing a whole lot of characteristic of tube distortion, uh, but as you start to turn up and up and up, and of course you're playing not a sine wave, you're not playing a keyboard in most of these amps, you're playing guitar. A guitar is a very dynamic thing. You pluck a string, its power might go up to 18 watts and then sustain down to 10 watts. And so it's constantly transitioning very quickly, dynamically, in and out of this power range of no sound to maybe even full sound. So what we were interested in is this magic number, which we preset, and we measure these tubes one at a time. And in measuring them one at a time, we would then set them aside and find duplications. In other words, we'd find uh, two tubes that were characteristically down here, and maybe we find two tubes that were characteristically up here in this area. And we, we plug in a pair of these tubes to a 50-watt amp and said, wow, those things sound great. Uh, you can automatically hear differences from the stock tubes to those tubes. But the characteristic was they were a little... Uh, I would say soft or easy to play and push into distortion. A pair of tubes up here that had a lot more headroom for, for distortion had a more dynamic characteristic, cleaner, brighter, tighter. So not only did we have match tubes which kind of improved everything, uh, but we also had tubes with characteristics that were predictable and gave us the ability eventually to call our number one or our number ten scale. So all tubes are basically matched in a one to ten scale. And that basically is a refinement of hundreds and even thousands daily of tubes that we measure and match and this basic system of a dynamic signal is pushed into a tube and we raise it up to full power and we're critical to know when this little flag goes off to tell us when it's that we then mark it at what power rating it had achieved this characteristic that we can hear and now we have measured something that's meaningful and we can put two tubes together that have this characteristic. Now. Um, let me just back up a little bit and, and, and tell you why that sounds better. And to understand that, you've got to have a little bit of understanding about how music works and how it's amplified. So I'm a, a short segment on that, and then we'll go to a, a final on the rating system for you. Okay, now, uh, the, well, I want to talk a little bit. We've talked about how we measure our tubes, how we put our sets together. Uh, so that we have two tubes in a circuit, but I think there's something you need to, you need to understand a little even further about how we're going to actually amplify signal. Perhaps you guys have seen a sine wave on an oscilloscope before. It'll have a line in the middle. Uh, well, some oscilloscope screens today are square. Most of them are. But what you're looking at is a vibration of, of, a, of a sound. This could be A440 or whatever. This is a note being played. And, and basically what we're, what we're looking at is, is there's a vibration that, that sound is, perhaps you guys understand that vibrating idea. Uh, but 
what we're going to do in an amplifier, there's a couple kinds of amps. You might have heard of Class A. Now, a Class A amp and a Class A B amp is a way of using those same two tubes in just a little bit different design. A Class A design would take, uh, let's call this over here a, a, a super reverb, and it's got going to have, yeah, I'm not very good at drawing tubes, but trust me, I know how to measure them. Um, these are two 6L6s and a super reverb, and that put out about 40 watts. And again, remember, uh, we're not so much interested in power, but the characteristic of sound. So as these two tubes are amplifying that sound, in a Class AB amplifier, you literally have this is your A tube and this is your B tube. So it splits this signal up. In fact, it's all, I should call it a phase splitter that does that, and that's the last tube in the preamp uh, of your amplifier that then pushes the signal. It's called a driver. It splits the phase and it drives the power tubes so that one tube up here is, is pushing the top half and it takes a rest while the bottom tube pushes the bottom half. And out of a pair of two 6L6s in a class AB mode, you will get 40 watts. Now a class A amplifier works a little differently. A class A amplifier uses that pair of tubes to push and so you have two tubes up here. Uh, well, let's say you have a, uh, an A and a B pushing, and then you have an A and a B pulling. So your push-pull essentially is the same team of tubes. It really doesn't matter if it's Class A or Class AB. The point being is both these tubes are getting the same signal from the guitar. They're going to rise up when you tell them to rise down, up, and they're going to come down and play soft you tell them to play soft. And they're always going into the, now that area of transition where they're going to start generating a harmonic. Well. If they do that the same way, then you're going to get a very natural balanced sound. But let's just say for a minute, let's go back to that class A example, a class A B example, so I can separate these out clearly for you in your mind. Let's say we have a one tube pushing the wave up and the other one coming down. And one of these tubes is a number one, and the other one is a number ten. Let's just say that's the worst case scenario. What we're going to say then our B tube, which might be a number ten, and our A tube might be a one. Our number one tube is going to start really clipping early. In other words, our sine wave, if you've ever looked at a oscilloscope, they can see distortion. It actually stops the waveform and no longer amplifies. It just kind of flattens out and it starts getting large amounts of distortion on it. And our B tube isn't there yet. The nature of the signal is we haven't pushed it that hard yet. So our B tube is clean, no distortion yet at, let's say, 12 or 13 watts. And our A tube, this is starting like crazy. Well, these two are going to sound different. As you might imagine, they might sound different. That's a difference between, let's say, a you know, a 20 watt speaker and a and a 100 watt speaker. You know, it's going to hit its level soon and start flapping in the wind and sounding terrible. And your 100 watt speaker is going to be clean as a whistle. When you put those two speakers in a speaker cabinet, you're going to have trouble because they create what is the enemy of every musical performance. It's phase cancellation. That's spelled P H A S E. That's because they always try and use two letters when they're talking scientific when one would do. Uh, and the other one is cancellation. Okay, those are fancy words. It basically means these two things this sound dissimilar. And because they sound dissimilar and you're listening to them at the same time, certain frequencies are going to be peaked, doubled. Other ones are going to be halved. And as you play up and down your scale on your guitar, you may have noticed and on a kind of a lousy sounding amp, the low strings are mushy, the high strings don't sustain, but the mid range sounds like your Carlos Santana. It's going to sustain forever. Well, middle range notes are easier to reproduce. Low frequencies and high frequencies are the harder to reproduce. Um, if you uh, can think of that in, in the term of uh, instruments, you know that uh, it takes a bigger drum to make the bass note, you know, then, then let's say a, 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 a smaller drum which make a mid note. So it takes more energy, more power to make bass notes. Subwoofers, bass amps are bigger. So in the characteristic of low frequency, your bass notes are going to start getting mushy here with a very unmatched set of tubes. Also your high frequencies uh, are going to just die out and literally decay very quickly. However, if you match these tubes, if they're both number tens, for instance, so they both have the same characteristic as that signal goes up and down, and they have a mirror image on as they reproduce that signal, uh, then they're not going to phase cancel. Well, that creates sustain. Literally, sustain is there, 
and phase cancellations creates decay. So if you eliminate phase cancellation, you eliminate decay, and you'll find that your high frequencies and your low frequencies will sound full and tight. Your high frequencies will sound sustained just like your E string will sustain like your G string. It's easy to understand that. And the bottom line, when you hit a full chord, all the contributing notes of that chord are going to have similar sustain points. And literally, the chord will have a fuller, richer sound as long as you want to sustain it. So what we're really doing by fine-tuning this electron engine is making sure that every note you play on your guitar gets the same attention and therefore your chords are stay chords and not just your dree string ringing out when everything else dies around it and unfortunately that's a condition I've been forced to play and many times you might have been in that same situation when you plug in a set of tubes matched in our system which is a dynamic way of how the tubes sound which is something that's musically meaningful and you plug in the thing you should expect and if you don't get this there's something else wrong or the tubes got broken and shipping because if you plug in a set of our tubes your amp you should get more sustain more balance more even fidelity in your amplifier and make it much more musical no nothing to play around everything works uh, and that's the experience you should have with Groove I had to put it in a word, it's balance. Much like a well-made guitar that's been set up really well as opposed to one just out of the box. It's more fun to play, it's more musical, your creative juices flow quicker, you're not fighting it. Uh, that's, the, that's what happens when you plug in a set of art tubes matched in this very meaningful way. Now there's uh, one other thing to understand once you understand this, and that is these rating systems. And in our next segment, we're going to talk a little bit about how you might apply some of these rating numbers we put on our tubes. Okay, we're going to talk about the Groove Tubes rating system. That's the, the production of this matching system we've talked about. That's the end result. Uh, and this was a critical decision I made early on. Uh, in the company. And again, I got to go back 25 years when none of this was known science. We were just learning about all of this. This had never been even explored before. People had only looked at tubes as electron devices, not as tone generators. So we were kind of in new territory. And when we found that uh, we had measured these tubes in this way, we still knew what we were hearing, but we wanted to be certain uh, about what we were doing. I'm going to I'm going to take the, a moment to tell you our my first actual hands-on experience with plugging groove tubes in an amplifier for a customer it came uh, uh, late in 1978, the year before I actually st officially started Groove Tubes. Uh, and I'd taken some of these tubes that were measured and matched in this very rudimentary way. The test equipment we had then was quite, quite cumbersome. It took me all day to measure 50 or 60 tubes. Today we do 100 tubes in about 20 minutes because uh, it's all computer controlled now that we've developed our own systems and we'll, we'll be seeing some of that process later here. But um, just to give you an idea, I'd spent pretty much a day measuring uh, some 6L6 uh, GEs that I got from the local distributor. And I took them down to the Doobie Brothers uh, rehearsal and recording studio. They were actually rehearsing and recording in the same studio in those days, kind of like a, 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 a captured, uh, kind of locked out situation where they left their equipment in there. And I had an invitation, and I knew the guys. And we did the, uh, the 310 Bandmaster for Pat Simmons in between breaks that they were doing, and they had been recording him during this time. So it was also interesting to hear what the amp sounded like before and after the tube change. And we changed the tubes and I changed the phase inverter and put a nice selected preamp tube in there. And I put a match pair of 6L6s done in this system, something about in the middle, maybe a number five. And uh, the uh, reflection uh, at that point in time initially was, gee, that sounds really good. Let's try that song again. And they played the same song again. At the end of the song, the engineer came running out of the studio and saying, what did you do to that amplifier? And uh, since I was on very strange turf and I was quite intimidated by the people I was around, I, I thought I was in trouble. I said, well, gee, you know, we just changed the tubes in this amplifier. I hope it didn't mess anything up. He says, well, all I know is that I've been running a compressor on his amplifier ever since we started this. And that sounds so good and so balanced, I could take the compressor off. I didn't need to compress his guitar amp anymore. And it sounds a lot more dynamic. And he's really sitting in the mix a lot better. And all this was kind of foreign to me at the time, other than... Oh, so I'm not in trouble. Okay, good. And uh, at that point in time, uh, Gene, uh, uh, Gene, Pat Simmons, I almost said Gene Simmons, different band. Uh, Pat Simmons said, gee, let's, let, let me hear that. And everybody heard it, and they all agreed, gee, that, that really sounds better. Let's go back and do this, and let's go back. And then I was in trouble because they wanted to re -go, want to go back and uh, kill a bunch more time in the studio. But it was their own studio, so it didn't matter. At any rate, 
they loved it. They, it was a good deal. And so uh, everybody in the band wound up getting groove tubes. We even did the, the Leslie for the, for the organ player. Uh, and they, uh, they went on the road. And then I realized uh, when they, and they, they ordered, as they usually do on a two or three month tour, they wanted to take extra tubes around because they would change those tubes every uh, you know, two or three or five or ten gigs, depending on the characteristic of it, to keep the tubes fresh. In the old days they did that because they would really wear out kind of fast and uh, the sound would go away. And uh, we didn't really know why that was. We do now. Uh, but it turned out when they came back from the tour, they called me up and they told me that they hadn't changed tubes the whole tour. They'd been out for three months and never changed tubes. And they said they really didn't want to change the sound that was sounding so good and it never deteriorated. And we began to see a parallel here. You know, you can go out and buy a set of tires and put them on your car yourself probably but they're not going to roll down the road very straight. In other words, if you balance them at the store, they're going to roll down the road straight. And what happens is they last a lot longer. We were finding out that there was other phenomena of this matching technique that had real positive benefits for the tube amp. One of them was because they were in a balanced system where they responded the same, the output transformer, which usually has to kind of balance all that out before it hits the speaker wasn't working as hard and we actually lowered the temperature on the output transformer that we could physically measure match set unmatched set we could lower significantly 10 15 percent lower heat in the output transformer so it was running cooler we also reasoned that these tubes because of this characteristic that we were measuring uh, wasn't something that was changing after a while where uh, Tubes measured in the old way where you're measuring power, as they power through their hours of use, what was a 20-watt tube could become an 18-watt tube. What was, be, was an 18-watt tube may stay right where it was for a while, so that whatever you measured in the power ratios, not only did it not make a difference in the sound, but it, uh, it was totally meaningless, meaningless measurement because in 20 or 30 hours of playing, uh, the power levels change so radically. But we measured those tubes from the Doogie Brothers when they came back, and even though they had a little less power than they went out, because they had a lot of hours on them, they still matched in our system. And, and so we could reason that the, the differences between, this is where we learned about how the differences in construction make, because of the physical location of the components produced these differences. And since those physical components weren't changing positions, neither was the characteristic to distort early or late changing. So what we were matching not only worked and made the tubes sound better, made the tubes work longer, you had more usable life, like balanced tires have more usable life, uh, but uh, they, they also lasted a lot longer, and the characteristic that we are measuring lasted with them. Even tubes after a year, year and a half in our system would still be very close to being a pair of match number ones, if not dead on. And that we wouldn't know until we actually had some hands-on use with them for a while. So that's, that's a little bit of a sidebar. But uh, now I want to talk about the actual meaning of, of the measuring the 1 to 10 system will make for you and your amplifier when you select.